Welcome to Dog Point Podcast, episode 11. Today we have a very special guest. We have Nicola Ferguson from the UK, author of The Force Free Dilemma, a very good book. We get into that in a minute. And um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit something about yourself? Well, hi, I'm absolutely delighted to be on the uh, Dog Point podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me and Isabel, who just sneaked behind me. Uh, <laughs> my name's Nicola Ferguson. I'm a dog trainer from the UK. I specialize mainly in Rottweilers and large breeds, uh, high drive breeds. Uh, I'm very passionate about IGP, uh, but I also train assistance dogs. I train everything from medical alert dogs to puppies to protection dogs, from Yorkshire Terriers to Rottweilers to canny horses. So uh, I like pretty much every dog. I, I think I fell in love with dogs at a very young age and I've never stopped. So I'm de really delighted to be here. All right. So uh, for our listeners, I want to put a little context uh, to this. Um, we met on somebody else's post <laughs> talking about dog training and training methods. And um, in the course of the conversation, you offered to send me this book for review. And um, I was delighted to receive it. And I'm more than three quarters through it. I have not completely finished yet. It, I will finish it by tomorrow. Um, but I must say, I have read a great deal of, of dog training books in my lifetime. Um, but this one is packed with more sense than many of them combined. So Hi. I would like to thank you for writing it. Um, because it also, in a very... Um, part humorous and part technical way um, dissects the dilemma that we are all facing in the industry and um, dispels a lot of notions that people have. And um, I'm so grateful for this because Real I live old. in the Caribbean so I don't get too much of it but I get it in comments. And the idea, if I always picture my dog in the hands of one of those guys, I mean, those force free trainers, and then the first thing that comes to mind is their hospital visit. <laughs> that is the only thing I can see. Because the idea of, of raising my dog completely force free would be ludicrous. Yeah. Absolutely ludicrous. He is one of those dogs that, you know, um, and I, you spoke in your book about it with the offensive drive, right? Who, yes. who kind of yes. enjoys the challenge and, and a little fight here and there. Well, and so don't. if, <laughs> yeah, to put it mildly, right? And if you don't know how to handle a dog like this in terms of letting him know that, no, this is not going to fly with me, then that can be a huge problem. Because the moment that he feels that he has one up on you, he will um, let you know that. You yes. Know? And I can I see a lot of Rottweiler owners that I know, and I know their dogs, if they had this dog, they would be in trouble. Yes, very much so. And I think partly I started thinking about writing this book because of my new IGP dog that I have. And she's she's a nice, very, very high drive. And it just made me think how many people would really, really be in trouble if they had her. And I think we're very much letting our large, high drive dogs down. You know, we're trying to breed out a lot of the, um, you know, offensive aggression within some of them, which is completely ruining the breed. We're creating soft, very nervous dogs, and um, that are not a true representative of the breed we all grew up grew up with and love. And it's, I think, um, getting a lot of owners into trouble as well. You know, they genuinely believe that. They must do as these extremists say. And I mean, I had one lady that's broken her leg twice through been pulled over by her Rottweiler because she believed the wow. only solution is having a flat collar on. Now, that's obviously, I can't imagine breaking your leg twice. And um, for all, all for want of a tool that's actually suitable for the dog in question. And as soon as he was introduced to a pinch collar, understood it, 
he, he just shrugged and said, okay, fine. I, I understand what you want now. I understand there's consequences if I behave badly. I'm not going to do it. And, you know, we got some really good engagement with the owner and, and that was the end of it. It was literally one or two training sessions and she doesn't have to worry about broken legs now. Uh, she understands how to train him, how to engage him. He also understands that there are consequences to his actions. And it was that simple, whereas she went for various other trainers who had said, well, if he sees a squirrel, just put some cheese on the floor. Well, but a high drive dog, cheese isn't going to do it compared to a squirrel. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's why she broke her leg twice. And I think that's really tragic. We're really letting owners down because she genuinely felt she was doing the right by her dog. But she was injuring herself, and this was very nearly a dog that could have been put into rescue and could have spent his his days in a in a cage. Yes, so or worse. Or, oh, yeah, or no, worse. Or worse, yeah. because yeah. when you have a dog like this that's powerful, and people have trouble to manage, we all know what happens in most shelters. Yeah. With with dogs like this, you know they don't make it. Yeah, because people will be afraid, and they, because they don't know the dog from from puppy. And so nobody wants to touch him with a ten foot, ten foot pole. And then, if he's there for a few months and nobody came forward to, to adopt him, then you know euthanasia yeah. is is on the table for this dog, unfortunately. Yeah, and it's it's a shame. It's a shame because you know a lot of them are good dogs. They're just being let down by humans. Yes. You know, and um, it is something that, as I said. We don't have that particular problem here where I live necessarily, but I get a lot of people talking to me online and asking questions and looking for advice and, and you know, book virtual sessions and all of that. And they're saying, I went to two trainers and my dog's behavior has absolutely not changed. Yeah. They spent thousands of dollars and got nowhere. And so, and then within a couple of sessions, you can fix a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, and 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 and, and they they get upset and angry after the fact because they realize they've been hard. Yeah. And that is I'm really I'm what it boils down to, right? Now there uh, there is some some trainers that that take their time and and you know try not to use any corrections as far as possible. And they do great work. Um, I don't want to cry down all force free trainers. There are some really good ones out there. You know, there are some that have won multiple um, um, agility world championships and so forth, like Susan. You know, but um, they're the minority. The majority wow. is just a, 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 an extremist side that it is either our way or the highway. And if you don't train our way, you are a bad person and you are this and you are that. And that is just ludicrous to somebody like me who has been working with dogs since I'm seven years old. Yeah. You know, the people that are a quarter my age, they come up and, and, and talk that talk and say, what life experience do you have? Forget dog training. You know, what life experience do you have at 20 to be yeah. talking that type of talk? You I, know? I think that's one of the big problems. You know, you people will look for trainers, they'll look on a website, and it'll be a very flashy, nice website. There'll be sort of 30 certifications of dog training on in every aspect, on aggression, on, um, you know, uh, separation of anxiety and training. And um, then they'll book an appointment and a, a 21-year-old spotty teenager you know, or someone turns up who's all their certifications have been online tests. They've never actually taken hold of the lead and handled the dog. And yep. they, and the person is, and, the, and the, unfortunately, they don't have solutions to the problem because they've never practically dealt with it. They've, they've read about it, but then when they're suddenly confronted with a large dog that, that stares them in the eye and says no, they're frightened and they don't know what to do. So they trip, throw their cheese on the ground and, uh, the dog just keeps staring at them and they say, okay, thank you, I've got my money, I'm, I'm off now. And they, they leave the, the owner with nothing, nothing except for, you know, confusion and a bill that they've paid. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of trainers that, you know, like yourself or like myself, we've been around for a long time, we've trained a lot of dogs and we don't necessarily have 30, we don't necessarily have a four or five year degree in behaviour or 
countless certificates, but what we do have is countless dogs successfully trained with happy owners. But unless you're very media savvy, it can be very difficult to persuade people. And I think particularly now when the extremists have taken over, very, very much so. And we're in a situation where we have countries in Europe that have banned certain tools. And of course, the good trainers are still using them. Um, people can't understand why your trainer can't train their dog. You know, and they're going to see IGP competitions. They're still using all these tools behind the scenes, openly saying, well, no, we don't use tools. And then it's giving the impression that tools aren't needed, when in fact, that isn't actually how the dog is trained at all. Yeah, there's and some people that... Dr- mess. There's some people that drive across the border to another yeah. country where it's not banned, train their dogs and come back. Yes, yeah. And so all whatever problems they encountered during during the um, training at home, they iron out those problems in another country oh. where it's okay to use the tools and then come back and continue training at home. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's know. absolute madness. Uh, yeah, no. Really, I'm always in the same situation because e-callers are legal in England and I'm maybe 10 miles away from Wales where e-callers are banned. Wow. Um, you know, so, you know, conceivably, you know, you could get a client that needs um, needs a recall who might come to me 10 miles over the border, train the dog and uh, and go back. But, you know, it, it's not fair. It, it, it's ridiculous that, that our... It isn't. Hypothetical lying should mean some people can train their dogs and some people can't, and uh, that you know even with an e-collar trained dog, you know you've um, you've not got that emergency break if some if something does happen and you've not got an e-collar on, mm-hmm. and they very quickly realise you know unless the training is kept updated that you know consequences are gone, especially a smart mm-hmm. dog. Yeah, um, it's it, like people saying, oh, if you keep them on a long line. Um, and teach them recall. Once you take the long line off, they'll still have a recall. Well, the dogs aren't really that stupid. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, no. They have got a brain. Yeah. They're, they're way they're smarter than that. And, yeah. and the reality is really, if, if a tool is used correctly, right, is if I'm putting the e-collar on, on my dog force, or if I'm putting a, a pinch collar on him, He's pushing his head through. He can't wait for me to put it on fast enough because it for him it represents oh we training. Yeah, exactly. And he gets all happy. His tail is wagging, and he's like, "Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up! Put it on, let's go." Yeah. And you know the 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 perception is being created out there that when you use those tools, your dog shuts down and gets depressed, and this and the other. My collar goes from one to one twenty seven. I'm using it at 12. Yeah. I, c- I put it on my arm or my neck and barely feel it. I, I can put you know, mine but, on... But they want to label me as abusive because I'm using an e-collar on occasion. I don't use it all the time, but there are no, certain things exactly. that I will use with him for where he's off leash in the yard or somewhere else. And I need to remind him of something. You know? And, yeah. This, yeah. He's I mean, I, f- I can um, put it on my tongue on the stimulus I use on my dog. So, uh, do you know what I mean? It's a five, that's what she can feel. And she doesn't need it. She very, very, well, I've got two dogs, but very, very rarely need it. But I, I can actually put it on my tongue and there's no pain and discomfort. So how can you tell me that something I can put on my tongue is causing my dog fear, pain and discomfort when the dog's body language is showing nothing but happiness. And it's so mild that my tongue, I'm not screaming in pain, it's just like, I can barely feel it. Um, people yeah. don't realize the training that goes into using an e-collar. And um, they think we're sort of, it's like an act of God. We're, we're sort of electrocuting the dog. And, and nothing could be further from the truth in, in, when it's properly used. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, I'll say to people, you know, do you want to, do you want, do you want to see it on my tongue? Do you want to, to see how you can start, start turning it up if you like and I'll keep it on my tongue? And they'll say, no, no, we're not interested. Don't want to see it. It's cruel. We won't listen. But so it's very, very close-minded. Because even at tools that I don't particularly like, um, such as head collars, I'm open-minded about it. And if a client says, look, this really works for my dog, I'm not going to say, Great. well, take it off or I won't train you. I'll say, well, if it works for you, the dog understands it and both parties are happy, that's fine. Maybe you need help with something else. But I'm not going to start throwing my weight around and saying, you must do it my way. 
because every dog is different and every client is different and it's wrong to disrespect the difference we have in our dogs and, and in our own personalities correct i i have met um quite a few dogs where the owners were using halties Bro. and i said okay well that is what what you've been working with show me what your dog is doing and when they try to put it on the dog is doing its utmost best to avoid it yes they, they hate it they hate, they hate it, they it. Hate it. Uh, and even when it's on they're constantly pawing at it and try to get it off and yeah i mean it's not is it you know, I mean, if you've got it tight enough to have an effect you're pressing on the very sensitive nerves and fascia on the face it's not so you always have this tight object that's putting pressure on your nerves how can it be comfortable and a lot of the assistance dog organizations that are starting to insist on using a halty, which i think is totally wrong they're putting on very very young puppies in an attempt to get them habituated to it from such a young age or not having problems with the dog constantly trying to pull it off and i feel if you're trying if you're saying ethically i am kinder because i don't use force how can you justify doing that that doesn't make sense to me as a trainer or as a human being yeah or if you that have a, a a young dalmatian that sees something and just takes off in a yeah. split second notice and you have a halty on this dog and he just jumps into it and yeah. takes off you can risk spinal injuries how is that sure. force free yes you know as and and on on the whole this, the whole concept to me is flawed the, i don't know that there's any creature on earth down to single cell organisms that goes through life force free and without consequences to actions that is no. how all of them learn all everything it's against nature to say uh, it's against nature to say that you know some pain discomfort um whatever you want to call it um that fear you know we, we learn i mean you know a dog will only jump up on the on the cooker and put his paw on a hot plate once now, i'm not saying you leave your hot plate on to teach your dog to jump up but but we learn and that, that that's one short sharp shot but that's how learning occurs in nature if, if you you know in nature if you read one you can make one bad mistake and get killed so you have to learn very very quickly and of course we must use a lot of um, encouragement and a huge amount of engagement with the dogs to make the training fun and uh you know and of course dogs learn everyone learns a lot quicker when they're having fun and through play but there also has to be consequences you can't have life without consequences and it's totally against nature to think that we can and also i think as well unskilled trainers who who put themselves over as force free they're using well they're using um food you're using things like food withholding or you can't have a dog that does something wrong when you ask it and give it food because not giving it food would be un, would be unkind so of course they're, they're using consequences by not giving them food but without giving the dog direction the dog can get extremely frustrated and just not be able to work out why he's he's not he's not getting rewarded because the dog thinks he's do, often thinks he's doing the right thing he's doing the right thing for him for going out going after a squirrel or if you're training him say in obedience he he thinks he's offering you the right behavior to get rewarded and when you withhold that reward but you never ever give guidance as to how to get the correct behavior and how to get the reward you're, you're creating a whole lot of frustration for the dog which can be far far more unfair and giving guidance because a correction doesn't have to be fearful harsh or anything else it's guidance it's saying to the dog well that's not right and the dog will say okay i'll try this great good dog big reward but they, they don't see it like that you know the like dog the... much prefer things to be black and white they don't want confusion and when you have a black and white life you have a much the dog is far more happy far more settled he doesn't have to worry about things whereas when you're very great Dogs do worry; they, they become very anxious. But this isn't a part of the force-free sort of extremist force-free agenda that that people are told about and that they see. And then you have the the issue with with competing motivators, right? Yes. So if I have a dog with medium food drive, that might be enough for obedience. But when I take the dog out of of the training room, out of the house, into into the public, and there is this squirrel. Yeah. Food is he lasting on his mind? Yes. <laughs> he doesn't care that you have a whole bag of treats in your pouch. 
that is that becomes secondary in a split second because I want that squirrel. Yeah. You know, so in, and even if you if you turn them around and, and which in itself is an aversive and then walked in the other direction and he turns around and wants to see where that squirrel is going, he's not gonna eat the food in your hand. He's not gonna be no. interested in it. Yeah. And they, they, there was one trainer that works his dog in, in, in protection and IGP and he had his Malinor on on a sleeve with a decoy and then yeah. told the dog oh, out <laughs> and dumped a whole bag of food yeah. over the dog. You saw that? And yeah. it, it did nothing to the dog. The dog was just continued biting. You know? Yeah. I mean, we, we it could was do that with both of our dogs. It was a parody, <laughs> but it, it was very powerful in its message. Yes. You know, there are certain things that no amount of food will, will get the dog to not do something. You know, if the competing motivator is stronger than, than the, the food drive, it's game over with that method. Exactly. And you and know? that's the way a lot of the, um, you know, extremist force free trainers do deceive people because they all of their training is done in a quiet, very, very quiet training room. So they can show all these tricks, all these nice behaviours, but they never take the dog out in public. So you'll see the dog doing wonderful things, but you won't see the dog walking down the street in public, never mind next to the squirrel tree, um, especially if it's a high drive dog. Or, or, or if they do, you, they will starve the dog for four or five days. I've heard of the worst I've heard is 14 days um, for search wow. and rescue dog. Yeah, yeah, 14 days because you um, wouldn't go on rubble but um, to search. But, you know, they might they might starve it for, for two or three days and then, you know, you you see them, you see the shop from behind and they're carrying food or a ball and the dog the dog is so hungry or, you know, by this time it, it's quite willing to give a, a nice performance for a camera. You know, people don't realise there's very, it's very easy to trick the camera into thinking a certain way, but that's not, you know, not really how life is or behind the scenes things are very different yeah and and, and some people will deprive water as well to calm a dog down and and how they can say this is kinder than giving a consequence for bad behavior i, I just don't know ethically i i don't think you can say that yeah, a, a quick tug on the leash and no and it's over yeah. and the dog behaves and then gets the food yes. for for stopping the behavior you know then the dog knows, okay, this one is not so nice, this one is much better, so I want to replicate this one because it's it's better, I get food. Yes, and the dog's making an yeah. active choice. So it's yep. the dog is choosing the right behavior because he understands consequence. So it's an actual choice on the part of the dog, which I think is, is far more powerful for the dog, and it builds resilience. You know, a dog needs to have resilience in life. Um, you know, just, That's... just thinking life is all sunshine and rainbows and unicorns that that isn't the way life is for any of us and it's not the way life is for a dog and unfortunately a dog that doesn't have consequences that is high drive or large eventually they do end up in a shelter and, and ultimately some of them get put to sleep for nothing more than being misunderstood and not having someone that actually knows how to train them and that's really tragic you know yeah. i compare it a little bit like as kids we were playing this game where you get blindfolded and then you have to yes, find something you know. hot and cold right? yeah and you just leave out hot. You just yeah. leave out one of them. Yeah. It takes you so much longer to find it if you ever find it because you have yeah. no reference point. And yes. it's, it's it's a little bit like that. Yeah, right? exactly. There, like there's, that. there's only yes and food and there's no no. So how how is the dog supposed to figure out which one is the better choice? You know, exactly. by con by living his entire life in a controlled environment where everything is managed. So, I I've heard of people going picking a route in 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 their town to walk their dog where there is no dogs at the gate that they have to pass because yeah. they can't get their dog's reactivity under control. Yes, and very commonly here, people will walk at midnight, so there's there's no one around, no dogs around. Um, although saying that I quite like walking at night myself because I my dogs will come back but because I have two you know very good recall they're social dogs but because I have two Rottweilers if anything happens it's always going to me that has be me that has the blame so I often like walking at night where it's peaceful and you know but other people walk because they, they have no control 
And it's really tragic to think that people aren't choosing to go out at night because they like it. I mean, I have autism, so I really like peace and quiet. But that's my choice, an active choice. Whereas people really don't, it's not much of a choice when your life is, well, I can go out at midnight to walk the dog, or I can go out at seven o'clock and I've got this rant and raving lunatic on the end, the lead and everyone's staring at me and people are calling the police and say, do you know what I mean? That, that isn't a, that isn't a cho- an actual choice. You've been forced <laughs> to go out at that time. And it's, you know, like right. you, I've had a lot, I have a lot of people that have been through a couple of trainers that have, have sort of think, well, there's no hope. And I've sort of said, well, come and see me. Don't pay me if, if I can't make it some sort of sense to you or a difference. And, you know, with one or two sessions, the dog understands. And because the problem was never a problem, really. It was a, a dog that had a person problem, not not a person that had a dog problem. And it's, it's sad that we're getting more and more people like that, that, that have, you know, paid out good money and um, had all the worry to think that maybe they'll have to give their dog up because the, the, the behavior is escalating. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the longer it's, it's left, that you know, the more, more self, you know, especially with reactivity, you know, longer it's left, the more self-rewarding it becomes when the barking and adrenaline really gets the dog worked up and he's enjoying it. He's enjoying this behavior and, uh, you know, and it just goes on and on. Then they go out at midnight and uh, dog and person aren't really, and then they'd stop going out at midnight because it's winter and it's cold. Uh, and, you know, it's just a, a disaster, really, for want of, uh, for what I've seen, no. Yeah. You know, just and no. Then the- and then, and, and then and then you have a situation in, in in the US and Canada where some dogs have to get training court ordered because they have a yeah. bite history and they have an ultimatum so they have 3 to 4 weeks to get their behavior under control or they will be ordered euthanized by the court war yeah. yeah so imagine such a dog goes to a force free trainer yeah. it has certain death i know i know that is certain I mean, death. I, I know two trainers in Canada that deal with cases like this. And within two days, they, they have the dogs behave and, and, and so forth. And they demonstrate that to, to a, a court-appointed person. And the dogs live and get back to their owners. Yeah. You know? But oh. if, if the, the force-free ideology takes over more, then what happens to those cases? You know, then it's just more dogs in the shelter, more dogs euthanized, and then we can only breed, you know, little squishy dogs that have no mind on their own because yeah. we have to we have to accommodate a bunch of people that can't say no. Yes. And unfortunately, I, I do believe this is a long term agenda. I mean, when I wrote my book, one of the scientific studies I looked at um said that. Uh, you know, it, it, it was biased. It wanted to say corrections are bad, and it ended up saying, "Well, some dogs need corrections. That that's the only way to train them, and we should not be breeding dogs that need corrections." Now, and you know, we've got vet, we've got bodies. There's a certain I can't remember the name now, but there's a veterinary group that's been set up to try and prevent the breeding of of what they believe are unhealthy dogs. So, in brachycephalic, long back. But also, uh, I noted dogs with big shoulders and heads. So they want to get rid of uh, mosslers, they want to get rid of rottweilers, mastiffs, and, and breeds like that, and, and high drive breeds. You know, there's an agenda that, that as you say, just said, is pushing towards getting rid of a dog with any, you know, I like small dogs, you know, pet dogs are nice, you know, toy dogs, whatever. But there is an agenda to get rid of our big, high drive working dogs and just have a collection of small, weak, fearful dogs. That, that won't go out or more than a metre away from her owner because they're too scared. So they don't really need a recall because they're, they're hiding behind her owner's legs all the time. And if all the dogs are like that, then, you know, they might yap at each other. But, um, you know, that's what people seem to want. Uh, and not everyone wants that. And it's not fair to say, well, this is the only dog you can have because it's it's all we can control with a couple of bits of cheese. And And if that's where it's heading, then we can also say goodbye to search and rescue dogs. Yes, because because how do you test for dogs that um, can do this type of work? You, you put, if you put yourself in the dog's position, there is a lot of unstable ground. There is steel, glass, smoke. There is all the ingredients to make a human scared and, and change diaper. What? 
And we're expecting a dog to go in there and under there and crawl through nooks and crannies to find people so that we can then dig them out. And the type of dog it takes to do that is a high drive, very confident dog. And if yeah, we can't and if we can't test for that through things like IGP, for instance, or Munduring or, or any of those dog sports and protection sports, PSA, then how do we get dogs suitable for this if we can't test for it? Yeah. You know, it's 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 just like in, in IGP when they did away with the with the pretend stick it. Yeah. They were not actually touching the dog. They were just pretending. And now yeah. they can't they can't even do that anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know, in training we do and you know, we do still use them and you even and when you and they're the padded dog, and flexible, you know. Padded, yeah, you could catch them no... over the head, but I wouldn't really care. And when a dog's working, it's not hurting the dog. It, it it's just, you know, it's just a sort of it's nothing. It's not bruising it's a touch. the dog. It's a touch. It's a touch. It's just a touch. It's a foam padded yeah. touch. Yeah, yeah, I've got the stick in my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> just because hanging there because it's part of my equipment. But um you know, and it's ridiculous, it's amazing. We we are promoting weak dogs in IGP to win the less the less brave dogs the dogs that um, are are like a circus trick in their protection they're they're going along in a beautiful heel work position don't really care where the helper is they're looking around to hide they're looking to hide for a ball because they're more interested in a ball than a helper mm-hmm. and you know you sort of think and police dogs as well increasingly I, I have a friend that boards police dogs and he said to me you know if you threw a ball. If you saw the ball cut the dog coming for you just throw a ball it's probably going to go another direction and that isn't funny these are dogs that are supposed to apprehend criminals they're not going to t- if a criminal turns around and kicks them or hits them the dog is frightened it doesn't want to engage it's been taught to bite as a, really an obedience exercise you look at you know some of these dogs have got some drive and they're not really that brave and we're increasingly Again, because, again, police are worried about litigation if the dog doesn't out immediately, if there's any damage, you know, to the person. We're, we're creating a, a, an increasing generations of very soft dogs. And once we lose these hard, very resilient dogs, these brave dogs, it's going to be very, very difficult to go into the genetics and get them back. Yeah, and we're not going to get narcotics detection dogs. We're not going to get explosive detection dogs. Because it takes a certain drive level to to perform that work. It does for and, and again it's you know, for the little yeah, docile the, the little docile mix from the shelter is not gonna do it. Unless no, exactly. he has really high prey drive, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And wants to and, work, you know. And I've worked in detection, right? So I can I yeah. can speak from first hand experience in the field. Um I trained my dog from, from puppy to narcotics dog. And and <laughs> His drive was insane, and that was what made him really, really good and fearless when he had to go under a vehicle or a 10 yeah. axle crane or something like that to, to, to check out something. You know, you need yeah. that confidence and drive level for any type of, you know, working ability for a dog. You and do. It, it goes even, even further, even if we move away from working dogs. I live in the Caribbean. There's a lot of houses that have pools. So you have to teach your dog how to get out of a pool. But you may have a dog that doesn't want to go into water in the first place. But mm. you have to teach him because there is yeah. there, there comes a point of time where there's a possibility that he's playing with another dog and falls in. Yeah. And then how does he get out? If you don't teach him, he will drown. So yeah. you must, must teach your dog how to get out. Even if it's causing a little stress getting him into the pool so that he can swim you around can. your body and back to the stairs so he understands that there are stairs that help him get out. We can't see them. Dogs don't see well through the water surface the way we do. And so he has to feel it. And he has to eventually has to do it so many times that he can pick a landmark where he knows if I'm aiming at that, at some point I feel land under my feet and I can come out. Yeah. And so you have to put the dog past his threshold and you have to put the dog past his comfort zone to, to get in there to, to teach the dog that. Yeah. You know, it's not oh, forceful. You know, no, it's not no. that we just throw the dog in and, and okay, find your way out. No, you have to 
you have the dog on a leash and it's a a, 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 a mix between coaxing the dog and you know hoping that the trust in you will make him follow you and a slight yeah. pull that prevents him from going backwards so i'm right. not pulling them forward into the pool but i'm uh, preventing them from going backwards so they have to make a choice i can't yeah. retreat do i trust him enough to follow him in this thing then eventually they do and then they get nothing but praise yeah while they're in it and then i teach them how to get back out and then we do it again and with every attempt they come in faster and faster you know and because they trust the process more and more and that and yeah they may never go in the pool again after that but they, if they fall in they know how to get out yeah and i've had customers send me video of this where look he fell in and he got out he went straight yeah. for the stairs you and know that's wonderful <laughs> you know yeah and and, and you know it, it then becomes very rewarding to see that it is you and know? i think people your know, dogs are emotional creatures i think what people forget is you know, ourselves as humans we like a challenge we like to ha achieve something and dogs like you know okay you know a certain you know especially working breeds they like to work they like a level of achievement you know when a dog has a challenge it, it builds resilience it builds trust in the handler it builds courage it builds a character of the dog and you know of course your small toy dog may just want to lie in the sofa all day and that's fine that's what it's been bred for but uh you know without our working dogs i'm saying you no know, search and rescue dogs drug dogs um, and you know even you know artificial noses don't come close to what a dog's nose is yet you know you, you would think with all this what we can do we can put humans in space to the moon we can do all this part surgery clone people but yeah we can't create an artificial nose as good as a dog's a dog's yep. nose is still better for detecting drugs and you know explosives and everything else so if we get rid of these really good high drive working dogs we're we're doing ourselves as humans a service because the world isn't kind and it's not going to get kinder and there's not going to be less wars anytime soon so you know Correct. there's still still very much a, a we, need for our dogs and we still have terrorism and we still have explosives floating around yes. out there and so we still need dogs to find it so that yeah. it keep they keep people safe yeah you know and when they when they people. when they were banning the tools in in in, in germany the police were saying so hold on a minute so we have these high drive confident police dogs how do you want us to control them now yeah you know they they're trained for crowd control for large scale demonstrations and how do you want us to to to, to keep them in you know under control when they're not supposed to be active if we can't use a pinch collar for instance yeah. and then because it's politicians that caused all of this then they say yeah okay well when you deploy the dogs you can use the, the pinch collar but you can't train with it mm. yeah H how much sense does that make you can't train yeah. with it but you can use it when you deploy the dog how are the dog and supposed to understand that this is what yeah. it does this is what it exactly. is and this and it's is why dog. it's being used you yeah, know if you dog. can't condition the dog to it and train the dog with it, it makes no, it's zero not fear sense on the dog. not fear on the dog you at know? all and, uh, and this this is what annoys me it's politicians that are bending to the will of a very small amount of extremists because as you say there are some fantastic force free trainers out there and i learn a huge uh, there's a couple of force free trainers i train with and i learn a huge amount from them and it's very useful for some dogs and it's not useful for others there's certain there's certain behaviors you can teach if you want to teach it in a force free way um it takes a lot longer, but you can get there if that's what a client really wants. And there's some things that you'll never teach with a certain dog of force freeway. It's Correct. just reality. As you say, if there's competing distractors around, you've got a high drive dog. Well, maybe you can take five years to teach it and but it, because it's old and stiff by the time it, it decides yeah. it's not going to go after a squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> but, or, uh, or, it, or it's a situation that, that means life and death for the dog. I, yes. had, um, I have a client and she has a lot of, all her dogs are rescues. And she lives on a large estate, and you have tractors driving around, you have bobcats driving around, ATVs yeah. driving around, right, with workers and all that. And she had um, a blind mastiff. 
So that dog was constantly hiding by the emergency generator. Well, somehow she had mapped out the path to that generator and yeah. was hiding there. So she called me and she says, you know, can you help this dog? And I said, yeah, sure. So I put the dog on, on a leash and I started at the kennels where, she, where her pillow is. And her kennels are always open. They're just more for shelter than anything. Yeah. And I started there and I walked the exact same path to down the driveway, down to the lawn, the other part of the lawn, to the house. You know, specific areas where you would want the dog to be in. And that yeah. that is great. So she could map it out in, in her brain as to where to go. And I even made her plant different flowers in different areas in her landscaping yeah. attempts. So the dog also has scent as a guide. Yeah. Yeah. And we live in the tropics, so they flower year round. Yeah. And, <laughs> and yeah. um so that was great but how do you give the dog an emergency break if the dog is stepping into the path of a reversing bobcat yeah where the driver can't see the dog it's impossible right so if somebody shouts stop the dog must freeze right must stop right and how do you teach that not yeah, with food exactly and you can't not with food it's a no. default correction it's a leash pop stop pop and then yeah. when she remains a few seconds in that position, then the food comes. Yes. You know, and she was doing great. So when every time some one of the workers or anybody shouted stop, she would just freeze right there. Yeah. And then they could walk up to her, take her by the collar and guide her away. Yeah. You know. And that I mean, what a wonderful gift to give to a dog, to give a dog the freedom to live without fear and to be able to live a normal life. And uh, as you say, with a blind dog, the same with deaf dogs. You know, deaf dogs are often just kept on lead. They they don't have um, you know, much of a life. And and again, it's a great gift to be able to use an e collar so that you can use that sensation to say, you know, look, look, look to your handler, come back. So again, that dog can Correct. then go off lead and enjoy enjoy freedom. Um, and then you've got predation. You know, if you've got rattlesnakes or you live in a country where there's things like snakes. You know, you want to teach the dog that this is a really bad idea. You never, ever go up and try and grab hold of, of a snake, for example. And you're not going to do that with a couple of pieces of cheese. But you can teach, you can prevent, you'll teach avoidance of, of things like rattlesnakes with an e-collar. Yeah. Well, here you know, here in, any, in the tropics, we have an invasive species that was introduced that is not native to here, which is the cane toad. Oh, yes, yeah. Which is poisonous. They brought it in from Australia. Yeah. And um, in a failed experiment. And um, it's killing dogs every year. Do we? Yeah. You know? So how do you teach a dog not to go after it? Because even the dogs that bit it and survived, there is no recollection of the incident because it's a neurotoxin these toads have. Yeah. So there's no memory of it. So they can't learn from it. And there's no side effects. It's all done in the brain. And yeah. so there, there is there is nothing for the dog to go on to learn that when I see this animal, it's dangerous for me. There's yes. nothing, you know. Yeah. And and so even with a even with a with a rattlesnake, if if it bites and misses, the dog understands that this thing wants to come after me. You know, oh. there is something. But a frog that just hopping along, they have yeah. no sense of danger there. Yeah. You know. It just triggers the prey drive and they want to catch it and then it's yes. lights out. And so how do you teach a dog not to go near frogs? You know? <laughs> You're, you can't you can obviously not, with an e collar. Not, not, <laughs> not with food. <laughs> not with food, no. <laughs> uh, with and food. and also protected species as well. Like you know, in Australia, you know, they do quite a lot of work, um, avoidance of protected species too. Uh, as well as your know, dangerous species. And you know, it just means that a dog can have freedom instead of being you know, kept on lead, kept on a long line permanently with the owner hyper vigilant and uh, unhappy on walks because they're scared the dog's going to beat something. You know, not everyone wants to live that sort of life with their dog. And I, I certainly don't like living a sort of hyper vigilant life where you're know, terrified uh, something bad's going to happen. And you know, I want to enjoy my dog. You know, I love my dogs and my sports dogs and one's my assistant's dog. But I also enjoy life with them as normal dogs. 
and I wouldn't be able to do that with such high drive dogs without using tools. And again, with disabled people, it's very unfair to say, well, you know, you need a, a dog that's got some drive to work, you know, if you're doing medical alert or whatever, you know, you, you're very weak, you've maybe got very little use of your hands, but, you know, we want you to be physically strong enough to be able to cope with the dog on a flat collar or something. And, you know, because some I know quite a few disabled people that have a pinch because they can use such a light touch on the dog. Correct. And to say to people like that, or an e-collar, uh, to say to people like that, well, you know, you're going to lose your dog now, you're going to lose your independence, your way of leaving home uh, because your dog is no longer suitable to work without tools. I think, you know, governments uh, are, are forgetting people like that. And, you know, we, what is the value, you know, society must look at the most weakest people in society and try and help them instead of just um, being an afterthought they don't really care about. You know, so what if a couple of thousand people are going to be homebound now? Well, I care. I care about them. Um, and I care about dogs. Yeah, I care about all dogs. And I just don't think it's fair that we are pretending that nature doesn't exist, that we live in some sort of utopia where there is no that, such yes, thing yes, as, I agree with uh, that. <laughs> you know, the, I absolutely you know, agree with reality. that. It is, it is a denial of reality that, that is behind all of this. Yes. You know, it, it's it's almost like people live in a virtual world that is not, not the real world. And, yeah. you know, and you can see it in some of the comments, you know. Yeah, I, I'm dealing with aggressive dogs all the time. Yet, if I go on the profile, there is not one video of you working a dog. Not yeah. one. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then there's also a difference between a dog that has a little fear aggression or a dog that has some barrier aggression yeah. versus a dog that has dominant aggression. Yeah. That is day and night to deal with. Very much so. If, and I think if you have a dominant aggressive yeah. dog and you come with at him with, with too much force, you're in just as much trouble as if you come with no force. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> there, is some, there is some force required because there are some dogs that if you come with too much, they meet you every step of the way. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, they do this. Yeah. And then there's yeah. dogs, if you come with nothing, oh, okay, you're a pushover. Nice. You're yeah, yeah. And then they do what they want. So you have to figure out how far can I go for the dog to understand that the behavior is not acceptable. And you just yeah. use enough to get that point across. You don't exactly. go past threshold. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think also people think your balance trainer just come in of, you know, with corrections, and that's not true. The first thing I want no. to build with a dog is engagement and trust in me. Because once a dog is really engaged with me, or once a dog trusts you, you can actually, even with quite dominant dogs, if they trust you, you can use, you know, you can use a correction and it's fine, they'll accept it because the trust is there. And, and, you've, and they've started seeing that when they live in this black and white way, life becomes a whole lot more enjoyable. Yes. Um, you know, I, but it always starts with engagement and, you know, making friends with the dog and getting some trust together. I, um, was, I was called to a, to a two-year-old male Rottweiler that started to become aggressive with the owners. So every time he had something and they wanted to take it or he was going for something that they wanted to take and they tried to beat him to it, well, he, would yeah, growl yeah. At the, he would growl at them and snap. And yeah. So they had him in the kennel and I, I got there and the dog, I mean, for lack of better words, the dog tried try to eat me yeah because he doesn't know me at all and he was super aggressive and i just stood by the kennel door with, with food yeah and every time he calmed down and he, he sat when he was trying to recover his breath i tossed him some food i said good boy good sit and so i got him conditioned to the word sit in that sure. position and then after a while i could raise the food and tell him sit and he would sit and then I did the same with the down and the first two sessions I was just teaching him those two positions and in the third one he has realized that this guy every time this guy comes he's working with me and I'm a working dog and I like to work yeah and so the fourth time I came he was wagging his tail and was a completely different body language and I could put him on the leash and take him out of the kennel of course when I wanted him to walk with me and he didn't want to walk and I gave him a tug, 
he wanted to growl. So yeah. he got a firmer tug and he said, hey. He stopped, he walked with me, and then he got food again. And he realized, oh, hang on a second. So if I just listen to this guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he was fine. And then I did the same thing with his owners and had them handle the dog in the same way. And they're fine now. You know, he's yeah. three and a half years old, no incident, and he's he's living life. They have him out, they throw a ball for him and throw a frisbee, and he's happy to bring it back. And, you know, because I did some engagement with him, I played engagement games, I played tug of war with him, I played frisbee with him, I toss a ball with him, and he loves those things. He's a working line Rottweiler, so he's yeah, he loves this, especially yeah, exactly. tug of war, you know. Yeah, so the, the the husband, all love tug of war. <laughs> yeah, so so the husband plays the tug of war, you know. Sometimes even the kids and he will pull them and they might fall down. But then when they let go, he just walks off with the toy. Yeah. You know? And they're having they giggling and they're having fun. Because for them yeah. it's like you versus me, let me see if I can hold on to it. You know, yeah. so it's it's a game for the kids. And for him. He doesn't and see it as anything other than that. You know, because he got the right guidance. Yeah. But can you imagine a dog like this being handled by somebody who is not believing in any form of corrections? That dog would be euthanized. Yeah. They, they wouldn't even yeah. handle the dog. I mean, I've had a couple of dogs with, you know, you know, confident dogs that, that you know, they weren't fear aggressive. They, they were, you know, quite dominant dogs. And the trainers that had come before, no one even though they were bringing lots of food none of them could touch the dog because they were scared uh, and you know and again it's about patience you know I'd come along well you'll give you some food and you'll give you some simple commands I give you some more food and we start to get a little bit of trust and then you know actually the dog is ha very happy to see you and wants to do things with you and um, whereas you know I think you know because we're you know used to big dogs we're not frightened whereas a lot of force free trainers will come and even though there's a barrier say the dog's on the other side of a fence or something that's war and, and they're frightened and they step back and, and of course for a dominant dog that's fantastic you you get yeah. you're pushing them back and it's wonderful uh, and then they'll throw some food and you know war and they'll throw some food and it's like well, what are you doing um, and then when you do someone that does know what they're doing comes in and you know you stand your ground and you know okay fine just wait till they stop and start making friends and and it, 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 the relationship actually comes quite quickly because the dog yep. wants to work the dog wants to have a, a relationship with someone that they can work with and have fun with because they're not really having fun trying it's not a secure happy place for a dog trying to boss everyone around uh, and sometimes been punished and sometimes not and not getting attention and life becomes far far better for the dog when they behave they get lots of reward they understand what the boundaries are and then they're starting to you know especially if you can then introduce some enrichment that's really fulfilling their genetic potential so maybe start doing obedience and scent work and uh you know and as you say just even top of a toy that's it's just the dog is half suddenly for the first time in his life is really enjoying life and he's engaging with you and it's funny because the owners will say you've only done one or two sessions my dog prefers you to me and it's like well i'm <laughs> You need to learn how to play with him. And this is what I'm here for, to teach you how to engage your dog, how to play with him, but also to set boundaries for him and correct him. Um, and yes. once the dog and the owner have start to build that trust, with, which is with each other, because they often don't have any trust or real relationship, when they start to build that, then often there's no stopping them very quickly. You know, they're off. And then, then a couple of months later, you'll hear they're they're going to a dog show and they've done an obedience class and, and they've got first place and and that's really really nice and then, then they're looking maybe for an igp trainer and it's lovely to take a dog that when they went through a couple of force free trainers and said oh we can't do anything with it and it's actually quite a simple solution it's a good dog and then suddenly the dog is having a fantastic life as his owner but as you say if the dog trainer comes and is frightened and does nothing well your dog can't be fixed and then off to the bet they go to be to it to sleep sometimes and yeah. it's, it's sad and i would have more respect for the extreme trainers if they recognized they were out of their debt and said okay well i can't fix this but try a balance trainer or here's i know somebody that's you know a good ethical trainer that you know is a good balance trainer 
and refer on instead of saying, well, it's my way or the highway, fourth three doesn't work for the stalk, so it has to die. That's what one of my really, really big objections with it. And it's extremists. It's not the good force free trainers out there. It's the extremists. Um, because, you know, the good force free trainers will be honest and say, well, either takes a long time or I can't do it. And it's your ethical decision if you want to go down a balanced route. And I respect trainers like that. I have no respect for extremists that would kill dogs because they have uh, an agenda they want to push on other people, including us. Yeah, and oftentimes um, the agenda is bigger than the skill level. Yes, far bigger. Right? And I always tell people, when you have a puppy and it grows up in your home, a puppy is pushing. It's pushing to this side and it's pushing to this side. And it's expecting the pushback. Yeah. That is how dogs figure out where their boundaries are, what they can do, what they cannot do. They want to find out. Yeah. They're actively trying, so they push you and they push you. And, and if you don't push back, they keep pushing and they keep pushing. And then we're in the problem behavior area. And then they, sure. at some point, it's so confusing to them. I said, I'm not getting any feedback. This, 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 I don't know. And then they get insecure because they don't yeah. know. They can't relax because they, they need to find out where the boundary is. Yeah, and it shows itself sometimes when when people complain to me and, and say, "When you come once a week, the greeting you get from my dog, I can't get that when I come from work." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why is that? And I said because for one hour, your dog knows exactly where the boundaries are. Yeah, and it can relax and it can move freely within those boundaries. And for the first time, you know, the dog gets to, whoo. Yeah. Right? Because yeah, dog, dogs, dogs need somebody to be in charge. Yeah. I would say above 90% of dogs are quite happy to follow. There's a small minority of dogs that wants to be the leader, that are the dominant ones. Most dogs are quite happily to follow somebody, you know. But you also have to show them that you lead them. Yes. And if you don't do that, and if you just let them be, then <laughs> you get problems. You know, it's just that with puppies, too much freedom too soon. Yeah. If I have a puppy and I can't supervise the dog, <laughs> the dog is in a playpen or a crate. Yeah. No. So people say, do, you don't get all that destruction in around the house. And it, I don't know. No. It's the occasional plant pot when he's upset with something. <laughs> but outside of that, you know, they don't take apart my car. They don't make eight garden hoses out of one. You know, I don't get that because they don't get the opportunity to do those things. Yes. You know, no, and, then they grow, and then they grow out of that phase and then they're fine. And then they have to, when that year is up, now they have to earn their freedom more and more. So I you know, forces in the bedroom right now, yeah, on his pillow, he gets half an hour unsupervised. Let me see what he will do. And I come back in, nothing is out of place. Good. So I know I can trust him for half an hour. Yes. And then we try an hour, and then we try an hour and a half, and two hours, and four hours. And then, okay, he has earned the trust that I can leave him in there for a few hours, and it's going to be fine. Yeah. Right? He, he lies down on the bed watching TV, and that's that. And so I do this with all my dogs. Yes. So I don't have those issues. You know? Yeah. And they, they, you open a crate, you don't say anything. You just open a crate. And the dog closest to the crate walks in. Yeah. It is so normal for them to go into a crate that you can transport them, you can take them to the vet. We have um, dry season and wet season. And in dry season, oftentimes, you get a lot of fires. So I have to move a crate um, from one room to the next so that the smoke doesn't get there, you know, and, and stuff like that. And then they have to be in a crate for a little longer period. And they're fine. They lie down and sleep. Yeah. It means nothing to them. I think, I think, yeah. They're, they're, they're not stressed. They're not depressed because yeah. they're in a crate. <laughs> yeah. <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's their dog cave, isn't it? It's their man cave and yes. uh, as a dog. But, um, you know, the thing is, I, I think it's becoming a lost skill training a dog to be good in the home. I mean, even some of the sports dog trainers I train with, but, you know, they, they don't, they look disbelievingly that I have two very high drive dogs that live in my house. I don't need to create them when I go out. I could if I wanted to create, 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 obviously, but 
they have access to the full house. They don't raid bins. They don't steal the cat food. They don't chase the cats. Because, you know, early on they learn, you know, their, their boundaries. And, uh, and and people just don't seem to believe me. Like, how can you leave a, a dog in the house that doesn't raid the bin? Well, because when they were young, there were consequences for raiding the bin. It's not something that even enters yes. their head now. Yes. No, it's not part of their options in life. So... Uh, you know, I can leave them for a couple of hours and everything is just as is when I come home. And, you know, they're content. They, they, all, they just go to sleep. They've not got any anxiety about me going out. And, or I can put them in the crate if I want to, um, if I had any reason to. Because it, I, I agree with you, it's very important to have them crate trained. So if they do need to go to the bed, if they need to be transported, you know, it's a comfortable place for them. Um, also... but I, th I think it's a dying art being able to teach a dog to be really good in the house and very reliable. Like you know, like you, I, I see so many people that have really insane problems in the house, which if they set boundaries for their puppies, would be, just never have occurred. Correct, and it's it's you know, so many different things like separation anxiety. If your dog has the structure of crate training in the first year, you don't get separation anxiety. The dog is is okay to be alone at times. Yeah. Right. So if, if Force is on his pillow in the bedroom and I leave the room, he doesn't know if I'm going to work to do a training session somewhere or I'm going to the fridge to get a yogurt. Yeah. He has no idea because I don't say bye. I don't say hi and make a big fuss when I come back. You know, oftentimes when I come home on the evening, I was just an hour in traffic trying to get home. And, you know, 54 years old, the bladder is full. Yeah. When I open the door to walk in there, the first thing he hears is move because I have to yeah. go to the washroom. <laughs> you know, this, this is too familiar for me. <laughs> right? And so when after he's calm again, when I'm back, and then I sit down on the bed and say, come. And then I greet yeah. him when he's in a calm frame of mind. So I don't feed that frenzied behavior. You yeah. Know? And a lot of people do that. Okay, bye bye now, behave yourself and this, that and the other. And then when they come, the dog can't wait for them to come back. And when they come back, the dog goes all crazy. And of course, they touch the dog and pet the dog, rewarding that type of behavior. Yeah. And yeah. I'm standing there and like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're, you're creating your own problems. Yes. You know? yeah. And once once you explain it to people then it's it's almost like this is the aha moment because when they think about it it makes perfect sense they just never got the chance to hear that yeah. right and i'll tell all my clients i'm not here to tell you what you want to hear i'm tell i'm here to tell you what you need to hear yes. and i'm german by birth so i don't come with a filter yes so <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that is the first thing that clients hear from me and then a couple of sessions in they understand why yeah you know because I pack it in a little humor but I try you know, to so. yeah <laughs> I, al I always try that you know and, and, and get them analogies from, from their work so if somebody works in the office I say okay so you have a high drive working dog but you want the dog to be calm in the house do you know what you're asking no Okay, do you drink coffee? Yes. Okay, drink a can of espresso and sit down on a chair and don't move. Yes. <laughs> I, I can't do that. I said, yeah, but that's how your dog feels. Or And then it clicks that maybe they need to exercise the dog more. Yes. <laughs> and then they do. Yeah. And they play tug of war and fetch and all that. And then I get a phone call. Hey, Mark, look at this. And then it point the camera at the dog on the couch next to them, stretched out, snoring away. Yeah. You know, I said, there you go. Or you know, it's exactly. oftentimes people people don't know, and it, it it happens. The problem behaviors come from a point of ignorance, in many instances. Even though I always say five minutes of Google could have told you that, you know. Well, oh, but, I don't but know. But people put people put a lot of research into anything that they buy, but not so much into what they need to do with their dog. And then yeah. oftentimes, nowadays, the advice that they're then seeing is don't say no. Well, we, we have a big yeah, problem with Google, unfortunately. Um, Google is telling people, uh, Google is pushing a very, very extreme force-free agenda. 
and you know, I I had a friend, not even a client, a very good friend of mine, that um, had a puppy. They have, you know, I don't want to be too personal, but they they wouldn't let me come up and help them. They wouldn't let another pair, wouldn't let another trainer come up to help them. So they were basically getting all their dog training advice on Google. And after a couple of months, they were living upstairs in the house with the puppy. The cats were living downstairs. They couldn't have the two meeting. And then eventually the puppy was jumping on the table and eating their dinner. And Google said they weren't even allowed to remove the plates. They just had to let them... What the, they, they just, whatever they were being told, they just had to let the dog eat it and make the right decision not to eat their dinner. And they put the dog to the pound. Um, and... Wow. They got another puppy two weeks later, and exactly the same thing will happen. And but Google is telling them that they mustn't say no; that uh, it's going to emotionally devastate their dog if they say no, or even just remove something from it that it shouldn't have. Uh, and how, I just couldn't. I I'm trying to figure out how where as 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 a society or as humans, where we went wrong. What? That that all common sense flies out the window and people see this and believe that this is a good idea i don't even if you're not a dog trainer just by, on principle alone when when did this happen that that you can get advice like this and it makes sense to you is it is it that when they have children and they're cooking something and they see the child walking towards the stove they just sit back on the couch and see what happens well, because you can't say no. So don't go well, there, it's hot. Yep. So they, they, they must wait until the child puts the hand on it and burns itself to understand it's hot. Well, I, I think I mean, it's, it's how, how, you know, it's the same people. Oh, putting a dog in a crate is cruel. Well, hang on a second. Was your child in a crib? Yes. And when it outgrew the crib, it was in a playpen? Yes. How is that different? When you couldn't supervise your child, it was in a playpen. How is that different from putting a dog in a playpen or in a crate? It's yeah, not. To be honest, my, right? my is, friends are young. They're, they're not even doing that. Their, their children aren't left for a second. And they have the very, very strange parenting ideas um, that bewilder me totally. <laughs> um, and I don't know whether it's... I, I just really really don't understand where where these ideas are coming from but uh you know i guess that's their generation of having children they, they, they're going to have to work it out themselves and I, well our, our parents do the best they feel they can they can um but where these crazy ideas are coming from I, I don't know you know i've got friends that they have children and they don't leave them alone for a second and that's just not good for a child i don't know what i don't know what age they're going to start leaving them alone you don't want them to go to school. They want them to mix with other children in case they get hurt, or or their 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 um, confidence is damaged by being told they've done something wrong. They get a song wrong, or just like, I, it's just maybe I'm yeah, just it's, getting it's, old. It's it's weird. I saw it's I saw weird. a video of of um, it it just showed the the playgrounds when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> and what they looked like, you know. And I remember all of them said, yeah, this cubicle thing, uh, when you slip and you fall, you hit everything on the way down. And you all buttered and bruised. The and and this, this spinning thing that we would, yeah. instead of standing on the inside, we would stand on the outside and was a dare as to who can hold on the longest and all this thing without getting sick or flying yeah. off, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and being thrown into another universe when yeah. you let go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or the 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 two story tall slides that were yeah, made out of metal that in oh, summer metal, yeah. <laughs> that in summer were piping hot, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, and we survived. Yeah, we survived, we right? Yeah. <laughs> but nowadays everything is so bubble wrapped, and and children are no longer taught how to, to resolve conflict and yeah. how to deal with conflict, and it shows. Because those are now the same children, being teenagers and, and young adults, that are in that force-free camp. Well, because yeah. that is what they know. That's what they grew up with. Everybody gets a trophy. Everything is nice. And life is not like this and never has been like this and never will be like never this. Never will be like this, no. 
you know it's it's a, it's a bit like demolition man right in their world yeah. where yeah. you get yeah. a ticket for if you say a bad word and 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 yeah. everything <laughs> and and you have to use your free seashells you know and and everybody walks around walks around in a robe and is be you know be merry and be happy yeah. unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately the world is not like that no, right? it's not. That's so, not. To, and it, it's not going to change because some people pretend it is like that, yeah. and that is that is where it evades any logic for me. You know, it is one thing that this is what you like, okay, but the world is not like this, and the world is not going to change because you want it to. Yeah, the reality is not just aggressive. going away. Neither can you explain it away. Yeah, and they're extremely aggressive in trying to force ram their ideas down our throats it's um yeah so while they're preaching peace and love they're they're actually being extremely manipulative and aggressive about it and very rude yeah. um and, and it's um, always science says right but science also said that smoking is not dangerous at some point yes yes science it, it's a pair by how much you pay the scientist and, and we know and we know how wrong that was <laughs> yes yeah yeah and so yeah and so science will at some point say that what they're saying now was utter rubbish right and it it yeah. will happen it will happen it, it, it does it already has you know yeah. there, you, you just need to choose sorry um my computer's overheating slightly uh, you just need to choose choose your scientist uh and you know even some of the four free papers as i said where they went out to prove um you know purely positive was best they, they ended up saying well some dogs you can't train like this but unfortunately yeah. then they come to the agenda well we must get rid of most dogs and, and that is and that is what i admire about trainers like like susan garrett who, who said she chose 30 years ago not to train with corrections and, and everything takes way longer and yeah. she admits that and and her sport doesn't require much corrections because it's all about forward movement yeah, and she's a multiple world champion in, in in agility, but she also admits she came across a dog that she could never let off the leash, because the yes. moment she opens the door, the dog would chase after something, and she had no way of fixing that, and she yeah. ended up giving the dog to another trainer who is a balance trainer, and where the dog was living happily ever after because the dog was allowed to be off leash and run around because it would not no longer chase after something. She yes. was just not prepared to do it. To do it, yeah. And and that I can respect. If you yeah. if you you know say okay, I don't want to use this, and I will work around wherever I can. And there there will be times where I can't do it, so I will get somebody else to do it, or give the dog to somebody who will give the dog the freedom that it deserves. Yes. That I can absolutely respect. What I can't yes, respect definitely. is you must do what 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 I do, or you're a bad person. Yeah. Right. Yes. And or unlike that person, people. I have I have volunteered more time in shelters than they will in a lifetime. Yeah. Trying to help dogs. So far, every dog that I featured on my social media and that I worked with has been adopted. Yeah. You know, we have a hundred percent track record thus far. And so, so the problem, yeah, in the UK, yeah. unfortunately, unless you're a force free trainer, they, they won't let you yeah. volunteer in shelters. And, you know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I've known trainers um, that have went into shelters, you yeah. know, in the past and made a massive difference. You totally turned around the adoption yeah. rate that, you know, and then someone else has come in to work there yeah. and management said, no, only force free. And so the, the, the you know, rate of adoption plummets and the dog, you know, they're just full constantly with dogs they can never rehome that are going to either be in a cage for the rest of their life or be destroyed to make way for some other dogs that will be in the cage for the rest of their life. It happens are smaller the, and cuter. It happens in the States too because I yeah. hear I hear people like Robert Cabral and, and, and Larry Crohn and those guys talk mm -hmm. about that as well. Yeah. You know, and Robert is somebody who spent an insane amount of time helping yeah. shelters. Yes, you know? yes. And it's, it, to me, I can't, I can't fathom it. You get somebody who's volunteering their time, who's not charging you as a Longer. to help you to make dogs more adoptable, but yeah. you rather kill them than let that happen. Yeah. Where is the sense in it? How is that force free? How is that humane? How is that? Cool. You know. It doesn't fit any of those criteria at all. 
It doesn't, but it brings in money, unfortunately. Um, you know, I, I, or at least they believe it brings in the most money from donations by saying, "Oh, you work," you know, we we will never. But they could market the same way for balance training. They, but they don't. And uh, you know, the, all the charities, the assistance dog charities, are now sort of force free. If you're not force free, you can't join the sort of organisations. You can't fly fly out of the country. You know, you're stuck in the UK unless you take a ferry or something out. But uh, you know, it's wow. it's it's crazy, and all the big charities are force free. And uh, you know, if you so if you said you were going to use balance training, they, they wouldn't let you have a dog. Or, so, they, so they, how... they might look at me and say, "No, we never adopt a dog to someone like you." You know, do sports, so, and uh, you know. So soon we will no longer have guide dogs for the blind. And um, yeah, well, 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 no. What we'll have is very badly behaved guide dogs for the blind, <laughs> which is what we have now. You know, I, I saw a guide dog one day walking around uh, the store with a, a leg of meat in its in its mouth. Wow. <laughs> because yeah, yeah and um you know i've had stories of people with guide dogs that um have uh, decided they don't want to go home they want to go to the park so that you know that you know not everyone that's blind is fully blind so we're partially blind but others aren't so the mm. dog has just refused to go home and it's just led them to the park and just said, no i'm not going home you can't make me and <laughs> you, the person can't get home you wow. know it's ridiculous uh you know it's so well, we used to have the best trained assistant dog, guide dogs, etc. Now they're some of the worst trained, in my opinion, because they they you know are either have a dog with enough drive that needs corrections, or they have such a low drive dog it doesn't want to do any work and it just wants to sleep on the sofa. And, and, I, and I'm and I'm and I'm picturing a, a blind person with a guide dog standing at a pedestrian traffic light trying to cross an avenue, and in the in the median where they have trees, there's a squirrel. Well, and, the, yeah. and the dog just darts across to go after the squirrel, and, yeah. and runs runs with with its human into traffic. Yes. You know, it's how is that making sense to people? It it's not. It's it's not. And you know that that's why they're they're starting to try and put halties and head collars on these very very young puppies, a couple of weeks old, thinking that's going to solve it. It's not going to solve no. it. You know, it's, they're just it's gonna not going to resist it more and more. And resent it. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, these dogs, I mean, a lot of dogs, um, people keep asking me when my dog's going to retire. She's coming up for seven. Um, but she absolutely loves her job. You know, she's not, you know, you know, people think because she has boundaries, she's not going to like her job. But no, she understands what the job is and she, what she can do and what she can't. And she really enjoys it. Whereas a lot of assistance dogs get very resentful and unhappy. Um, you know, I, I, I think they're, it's just very sad. They they don't enjoy the job. Retired early, uh, you know. And I can't can't see my dog really retiring until she's sort of arthritic, and um, because she's a very much a very gregarious dog, she enjoys her job. So, you know, I'm very much of opinion. Once she's finished work, once I'm out of the shop, I'll, I'll, if people want to come up and ask me to pat her, I'm, I'm happy for her to have a little bit of time for herself, to have some attention, and it keeps her very very happy with the job. And that right. that's something that's very known in the assistance dog community, but. For me as well, I mean, I'm I like talking to people, so you know, it suits me and the dog. You know, if I had if I didn't like talking to people, I'd have maybe a dog like Weena who's very aloof, and then right. you know. But you know, I, people just don't often take the dog's personality into consideration when when working their dog. And for me, you know, you, it's a partnership. So although there are certain things that are only for me to say that the dog must do. There's also needs to be some give and take in terms of the dog's personality. If it really does like people, then you know, I'm okay to give her five minutes if somebody says, "Can I give her a pat?" If she's not working, that's fine. And you know, there's certain decisions my dog has to make. You know, scent work, and that's a dog's decision. The dog, I can't tell the dog when it smells something, so I have to put all my trust into my dog for medical alert. Correct. So, but one responsibility. So I have my responsibilities, which are keeping her safe, making sure. You know, she's in a very good sort of, uh, never feels worried about the environment. You know, other dogs aren't allowed to interrupt or annoy or whatever. So she's very safe and she's very um, comfortable with what her tasks are, what her role is and, the, and my leadership. But there's times she's my leader. So when I need a medical alert, she's making the decision. See, she's saying to me, look, you're not well. You need to sit down. And that's very, very, 
you know, it's a relationship we have together that's that's very special, I think. And, you know, with your other work with dog search and rescue, you put so much trust in your dog in their senses. You know, if you're looking for bombs, you don't want a dog that's going to miss, you know? Correct. But even <laughs> even with my with my shepherd ninja, right, a narcotics dog, um, I could work him in a busy car park with people walking around, and he's searching cars, he's circling cars, yeah, and, and checking, and I can just whistle and point at another car, and he will leave this one and go to that one, yeah. just like how you can direct a sheepdog, yes, right? yeah, right, and he was fully protection trained, yeah. So there's one person that forgot that the dogs are in the car park and he's on his phone and Ninja now is turning the corner of a car into the pathway where he was walking and he gets startled and he's throwing his phone up in the air he's yeah. going, wah! <laughs> and, and catches his phone and of course it's a behavior that has the dog pause. So Ninja looked at him and then turned around and looked at me and it's like, yeah. you, you, you want me to scrap him? I said, no. Yeah, Such. no. <laughs> Search. And he goes, okay. Puts the nose back on the bumper and continued around the car. And, and this guy said, how is, did this dog not bite me? How is this possible? Right. And he was, was somebody from, from management. And then Safety Week came up and then we demonstrated it. We yeah. People were posing with pictures with the dog and, and, and all that. And then, you know, afterwards do a protection demo. And people went, yeah. I just hugged this dog. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And it, it drove home the point that you can switch them on and you can switch them off if yeah. they're well trained. Exactly. You know, I trained I trained a safe handling course for the veterinary school here, I and I did the same thing. I took him with me, and I put him under the whiteboard in the lecture hall where he was for an hour and a half not moving while I was yeah. lecturing. And then okay, we take a break and and we have a little obedience demo outside. Uh -huh. so I did that. What they didn't know is that I also had a decoy on standby. Yeah. So I let them pose with the pictures and I said, I hand them, Alicia, can you walk him down the corridor? And they did all of that. And then afterwards, did a protection demo with him. <laughs> and people were like, Yeah. <laughs> I, I just dog? touched the dog. And <laughs> they're, they're going in their phone and he, I just, you know, I just. <laughs> yeah. And then afterwards, I mean, brought him back in the lecture hall, put them in a platz under the whiteboard. And it is the second half of the lecture for an hour yeah. and a half where he was sleeping. Yeah. And it's like, how is he not moving? I said, because he's trained. Yeah. yeah. The last thing he heard was plots. That means he's staying there until he hears something else. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right? you know, Maisie, my um, assistant's dog, she's my working medical alert dog, but she she was, she's had some protection training. And um, the only time I've ever had any concern was um, when I was in an x-ray department and I came out and there's all these people with bare arms and plaster like a, like a sleeve. <laughs> And mm -hmm. she looked at it and I said, not, not here, not the time and place. And she just like, oh, okay then. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do the same with force. No, no, no. But me, she's right? so I wouldn't, I valid. wouldn't have put force in that same position that I'd put no, Ninja no, no. in. Because no. he was a different temperament. Exactly, yeah. Ninja was super confident, but he was not a dominant dog. Yeah. He was very confident. He was not scared of anything. He would climb around in the suspension of a 10-axle crane. He would go in a tool container where all the tools on scattered on the ground and he would climb through this to check for narcotics in the dark. Mm. You know, he would do all of those things. <laughs> yeah. But because he wouldn't wait until I come with a torchlight. He started once yeah. he was inside, you know. But he was social otherwise. Yes. Right? And for a while, I can have him among people in a down, and he's fine until somebody wants to pet him. Exactly. And that is where he says, mm -mm. No, my space, yeah. There's yeah. only a handful of people that get to touch me. You're not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And the dog needs to be suited for a job. And, and that, is the, that is the dominance in him, right? That, that is where he's like, Nope, not happening. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I love him for it. Yeah. Because I live in a country that has relatively high crime, right? And he makes me feel a lot safer. Yes, yeah, definitely. And he's mentally completely stable, but he's not backing down from anything. No, exactly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I just, I love that about him. Yeah. You know, and, and at home he's, he's just like a little teddy bear. He's just <laughs> with us. He's like really a super sweet dog, you know? But then that, that's in, what I in, love in, about the Rottweiler. 
They yes. are for for me, you know, although you know, I love shepherds, I love our breeds, for me the Rottweiler just has that sociability and loving nature inside the house with his own people. You know, yeah. like mine are always beside me, always want to be touching me. And no separation anxiety, I can leave them. But their preference when I'm in the house is to be very close to me. Um and, you know, I'm you know, live I'm a typical, typical little old lady with two cats and two dogs. <laughs> but uh, instead of two Yorkshire Terriers or two Rottweilers <laughs> and they're trained in protection. But um, you know, I, yeah. I like having you know, I like having the, the affection from my dogs. They're you're so loving and uh, I think you saw the video of my, my Rottweiler, my YGP dog, you know, she likes to sleep in my arms, you know, she goes to sleep cuddled and she snores and you know like you were saying with your dog people wouldn't believe when they if they saw her out in the field you know, actually yeah actually do protection work they wouldn't think it's not the same dog you know and um, this thing's a monster whereas this thing's a, a love bug <laughs> yep. same dog and same I think with him same with him at home right yeah the, now his snuggling is conditional right he, he snuggles for as long as you pet him and when you stop he turns around Her. and you, you you're looking at his back yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because he turns in protest that you yeah. stop that you stop petting him. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, other than that, he's he would come from his pillow to the side of the bed every five minutes and put his head on the mattress to check in. Yeah, you know. and I like that even in, when he's out in the yard. You know, he carries around his Kong toy oh. and checks in every now and again. Yeah, yeah, that and that's the same know. with mine when I walk them. Um, well, one of one of them doesn't never really goes too far away. The one that does medical alert, which is partly yeah. that I think she, she kind of takes the responsibilities quite seriously, which is why both of them do it. So she gets a rest at night. So if she's very one dog. My dog I take in public. She does medical alert in public, whereas the other dog does more at home. So she okay. gets a bit of a rest. But the other dog, um, she's a kind of perimeter that she never goes beyond, and she comes back and checks in with me every couple of minutes. And that's really nice. I, I like going on walks because it's very relaxing when, you know, especially in a forest or something, when they're maybe a little bit out of sight, but you know they're going to come back and check in and they're never going to go beyond a sort of certain distance. Um, I right. tend not to go into forests during the day when there's a lot of loose dogs running about. Um, I prefer my forest walks in the evening where it's really quiet. I'm very lucky I've got a park where there's a very, very long drive into the car park. So if there's no one else in the car park, there's no one else there. And right. you know, I can just walk, and it's cool, and it's nice, and I can smell the honeysuckle, and hear the owls, and uh, that's nicer <laughs> than in the day when there's hundreds of kids screaming and hundreds of little yappy dogs, and you know, and that's my autism. I, I like that peace and quiet at night. Yeah, which brings me to another topic that I wanted to to discuss with you, which is a bit away from training, and it goes more into breeding, sure. and that is some of the the smaller dogs. Now, I'm training uh, quite a few French Bulldogs. And most of them, they live in air condition, so they're fine. Yeah. They get the exercise in the apartment with, yeah. tug, of, with tug of war and, and, and those <laughs> kind of things. Because they're, yeah. they're little gladiators. They love tug of war. They do, actually. They're quite But what I, the breed that I feel very sorry for is pugs. Why? Yeah. They're cute, cuddly dogs. But... They are bred almost to the point of not being able to live. Yes. And that to me is so unethical that, you know, it borders on, on criminal. It, yeah. And there was a, a reporter in the UK a few years back that was interviewing breeders. And it was the pug, then the, 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 um, the King Cavalier... Cavalier King Charles, Ch yeah. King Charles, Spaniels, and so forth, where the brain grows more than the skull. And yeah, in constant pain. Yeah. yeah. And the pugs not being able to breathe and the eyes popping out. And they were asking breeders, why are you breeding dogs like that? And breeders got super defensive. And, yes. and arrogant and flippant. And said, if that is what people want, then that's what people get. And you can't tell me I can't do it. Order. And my thing is, you have a kennel club that is supposed to prevent that. Because everything in their mission statements and so forth talks about the welfare of dogs and welfare this and protect this, but they're not really caring about the welfare at all. They don't care. I mean, did you see Crofts this year? 
there was a lot of debate about the pub that was the winner of um i think whatever toy group or whatever and mm -hmm. um it had slits for nostrils now everyone was saying no it's an ethical breeder because um it's passed the boas test which is brachiocephalic ob obstructive airway syndrome now if you look into so cambridge university has this boas test the dog had passed it now you would think a veterinary test to look at whether a dog is structurally healthy might actually involve something kind of scientific, possibly, <laughs> a little bit veterinary side. Um, basically, what the test involves is taking the dog and walking it around for about a minute. So this is what's termed exercise for these dogs, is gently walking it around for a minute, then they take a stethoscope and listen to the larynx and listen to the external can you hear it making a funny noise and that's it that is their test so they're not looking at the length of the soft palate they're not looking at how obstructive the nostrils are nothing you just let's have a little donder around at a walk and see if you're breathing heavily and that's their view that, that's their test essentially their test on whether the dog is structurally healthy and that's just a joke and like if, if, that's if you terrible if you didn't look like because I before I looked into the test, I thought it would be something like, oh, they'll anaesthetize the dog, they'll look at the length of the soft palate, they'll you know, they'll do all these things that you would really look at if you really structurally wanted to see if that dog was sound. But it's nothing like that. It, it and and then it, you just think it's a joke. Okay, so it's passed this test. But in reality it wouldn't be able to go for a walk, possibly. I I don't know, I can't tell for that particular dog. But I, I, and then again, when people look, you know, this ethical breeder, and I'll, you know, consume me if she wants, it's all online. If you look up the Kennel Club record of the dog, I think it was bred at something like nine months to its half sister. <laughs> you know, so it's not really been health tested or, you know, so this is just an example of the Kennel Club merely taking money from breeders that, in my view, aren't behaving ethically. And I'm, I'm entitled to think personally that isn't ethical. So, you know, um, I yeah, don't want to attack one particular breeder or dog, but, um, you know, after all what happened online, I don't think my viewpoint is suddenly going to be controversial or anything that's not said before and anything that's not officially recorded. So it's just a statement of fact. Uh, that just saw, just saw a few years ago in, in Westminster show. Yeah, the German Shepherd. By the way, yeah. meet, Kla meet Klaus. He's my only Oh, hello, Klaus. <laughs> where the hawks from from the ankle to the hook yeah. was flat on the ground when he was that, yeah. uh, when he was trotting i saw that i saw that and he won and yeah. i'm looking at that as a as a owner of of working line shepherds i'm yeah. looking at that and i'm like how how is this Bro. dog going to run around 400 head of sheep for 12 hours yeah, yeah. it, it it's so sad it is terrible. Yeah, and they're wobbly on their hind legs. You know, they're unstable. You know, if you, if you poked them with your finger, they'd probably just tip over and fall. They, they have no functional, you know, and again, that comes back to the IGP and what's going wrong, because really the IGP world, in terms of the rules, is very much under the sort of Je German shepherd sort of people. Um, and things like IGP-1 now, they're lowering the A-frame to make the angle very, very gradual, things like that. Because the shepherds don't have enough power in their back legs to even jump over an egg frame, to scramble up, and wow. putting the one putting the one meter hurdle, I think they want it down. These proposed changes down to sixty centimeters because they can't jump a meter. Wow. That's a show line dogs that they need to get. You know, I think an IGP one before they get all their various titles and their sort of titles are complete. So they're they're changing the sport to, to a, accommodate. A these weak dogs that structurally can't even jump over a little hurdle and um, can't scramble up an A-frame, uh, the protection work. Again, you know, it's, you know what it's like in Germany. You know, I don't really have to tell you how things can work there uh, in terms of money passing, changing hands and dogs getting oh. titles and getting titles in a car park I've heard of and not, not proper show. And yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have so, then you have organizations that are trying to fix that, like you have well, the, the, the RSV two thousand, who yes. have their own the old shots on rules. Mm, yeah. So they still have the padded stick. They still have you mm -hmm. know the dog has mm -hmm. to pass certain tests. 
and and so they trying to preserve the German Shepherd. Yes. And German Shepherd, should. German Shepherd, and Malinois. I think is the two breeds covered under under the RSV. And it's, I think it's a good it's a good thing that that's being done. You know, I'm not sure how how much the growth will be and the popularity will be, but, but I'm I'm happy that they exist. Yes. And that somebody's doing something about this and is preventing the decline of the German Shepherd. Yeah. You know, to me as a German, Big that that is what everybody knows knows us by, right? <laughs> German yeah. Shepherds. Yeah. Know, and to an extent, Rottweilers. And that's why I'm so yeah. happy that, that my breeder, One Head Vanguard Kennels, Aaron Thomas, is always looking for a working dog that can show. Yes. He doesn't want a show dog that could work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, clearly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the emphasis is on working. And the same yeah. with, with his with his mentor in, in, in Belgium, Falcon's Nest Kennel. Yeah. Right? And I've I've met the dogs that he brought in. I've worked with some of them and I I just love them. Super confident. Wherever they go, they, they enter a new training field and they walk up on the field and they own it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's no matter what environment you put them in. Same with force. You take him anywhere and he's like, What's going on? Yeah. You know, no, that that's what I love about my bitch as well. She's super confident, you know. Um, I can take her anywhere. She's very social, which is good for IGP, uh, because the the vets are all over them now. And you know, if there's any, you know, dogs have been disqualified for you know being a bit spicy with the vet. So even things like that, and you know, we've got to it's a different sport now. But she's very super confident dog, very very curious, uh, very predictable. Uh, you know, in her behaviour, balance, but extremely high dry, uh, and uh, she's 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 a working dog. She doesn't look like a show dog, and unfortunately, I didn't tape her ears enough when she was younger. So her ears, uh, as the breeder flying. said, they were, yeah, the breeder said they were very the good. Same, when she the left, same with but they're not the same. High. The same with my female, forces aren't. Yeah. Her ears are flying as well. Yeah, 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 but she's. And as far as driving is concerned, she's a black and tan Malino. Yeah, but mine and is a little bit the same. But, yeah, but a good approach in the house, but outside the house. Um, you know, I, I sort of say, well, when I'm walking or, or, you know, if you hear a sonic boom, if you're a bang, it's a sonic boom for when reaching Mach 5 when, uh, <laughs> you know, when she starts running round and round, you know, it just, uh, just has so much energy. And, you know, she gets tracked every day, obedience every day. Um, you know, we go to the club two, three times a week, so we're doing obedience and protection. But you, you can never really give her enough work. You know, she loves yeah. to work, and she's she just you know she's all what what what. I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, I'm dying of blue. I've you've been out twice. What what what? <laughs> yeah. You know, but that's what I bought her for. I bought her to be a really top level sports dog, and you know, you need that sort of energy nowadays. Um, you know, it's for really nice obedience and the drive. Yeah. So and, yeah, and to compete, yeah. Yeah, because I'm what not... she's up against is the Malinois. Yeah, and she she's good enough to um, compete against Malinois on e an equal basis. It's just whether I'm good enough to train her. <laughs> well, well see. It's the same here. You know, as, as trainers, we're oftentimes busy training everybody else's dog, that the training of our own dogs can can suffer at times. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm very at lucky. At least in my case here, this is, you know, yeah, and then the temperature is a problem. So sometimes when I have the time. You know, it's 32 degrees with 90% humidity. It's just, mm, I can't yeah. train a dog in that. You know, so it's not always conducive. You know. But, yeah. It, I think I guess we pretty much covered everything that we set out to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I want to remind people again, get this book. The Dog oh, Training thank Dilemma. You and um, we also put it on our Amazon storefront. Oh, it's available you. on Amazon and we have yeah. an Amazon storefront. So okay. we, we put it there as well. So that when people go to dogpoint.pet, go on the shop now, Amazon storefront, and the book is right there. Oh, wonderful. And if I could just mention my um, training business in the UK, it's uh, rottweilertraining.co.uk. So... Um, I do train other breeds, but you know my my deep love is the Rottweiler. I, you know, I think as you get older, you sort of think, you know what? I just want to train the dogs that I really, 
really like. Yes. Um, so, yes. You know. You know. I think. I don't think. But at a certain age, we, we also earn the right to to have the dogs that we want. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, I love I love Rotties. Always have, even as a kid. I was yeah. always Rotties was always my my breed, and because I always admired the this this Doctor Jackal and Mister Hyde way of them. Yeah. You know the very nice and cuddly with the family, but absolute beasts when when it comes to protection yeah definitely and a dog that have that can have both extremes you know and is stable on top of that is it's very just what, very what, rare. what i gravitate to yeah i mean that that's all I, you know i i can't ask for more you know that that's and that, that's what i feel i've got in this in both of my dogs but especially this bitch she's a uh, very special this young bitch and um you know, uh, I keep say, I keep thinking to her, one day we're going to be IFR world champions, but that's our aim. Maybe, maybe I should aim a little bit lower, but I think, you know, you've got to lean to the top and the bitch can do it, whether I can train her well enough is another thing. We'll see. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You, should, you should never aim too low. You always no, always aim high and then go as far as you can. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I'll because, be happens. Because I find if we, if we aim low, then we stop short. Yes. And, you, you know, know, this bitch tries her heart out for me, and that's all I can ask. Uh, every training session, yeah. she gives me 100%. And, and if, you have a, if you have a good club and a good team, because yeah. people don't realize that training a dog to competition level, it is no one person doing this. Exactly, yeah. Anytime somebody says, yeah, I did it all by myself, they are lying. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. It is. It is. It is a team effort to get a dog into onto high competition level, hands down. Because you don't see everything. When you handle a dog, you don't see all, you know, the little crabbing here and there, or the the you know, the position a little off, or the head position off. And and these days, it's easy to lose points for head position alone. Yeah, and they're smart. You know, we because in the UK it's so wet. Um, when I was doing our down in motion. Uh, you know, because I can't look at her, you know, I'm doing cocktail, mm-hmm. you know, focus heel work. So I'm looking ahead, I tell her to down, and then after maybe three or four steps, or whatever, I'll look behind me and she's down. When I started rec- and at the club, perfect down in motion. When I started recording myself, she would sit, because she doesn't like the wet ground, so she would sit, and as soon as she saw my head start to turn, she'd quickly down. So of course I'd turn, she'd be down and I'd reward her, <laughs> and she hadn't done it right at all. Um, yeah. So you know you need people there always, and I'm very very lucky. I've got an absolutely fantastic club. Um, my trainer is wonderful, and him and his wife I think have been to the last twenty, probably qualified or been either one of them team captain or whatever to the last twenty world championships in IGP, usually for German Shepherds. Um, they'll, they'll go. So you know they're absolutely they've got so much experience, and you know um, my trainer has been so kind with his time and his knowledge. Um, so I've I've got the best trainer in the UK. Um, it's up to me now. It's up That's, to me that is me. all you can wish for, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. all you can wish for. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very you lucky. Know. Great support from other club members, you know. So and that's uh, what it takes. And there's there's this other trainer in 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 the UK, um, Obsidian. Yes. Yeah. He he travels every month to 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 Holland. Mm, yeah. To a trainer there to help him, to to compete with his dog. You know, yeah. some of the best look for help. Oh, well, ev- you know? every trainer, you know, every, I mean, my trainers, um, my trainer has trainers. Yes. <laughs> you know, we, we always have about three really, really good trainers at the club at any one time. It doesn't matter how good you are. Somebody will be watching you and helping you. Um, yes. It doesn't matter if you've been to 20 world championships and been in the top 10. You, you still need a trainer. You know, Ivan Correct. Babalano will have people watching every single session he does and, and film people. everything because everything. you can always film go back it. and analyze and you know yeah i film that, everything that, now as yes, well that is, it's a work. great help it's a great help because yeah. you you know even if the team is limited you can always go back in the video and check and say okay you see this we have to work on this yeah you know and i i was shocked when i saw that bitch not not downing and just sitting and hovering because she didn't like the wet ground and as soon as she saw a slight turn of my head, she was just down immediately. I couldn't believe she'd probably been doing this for months. Uh, never did it at the top. If you look at the, the if you look at the video in in um, I posted it on Facebook recently with Ninja doing his BH. Oh. Um, you'd see that 
for the sit, I stopped because they had changed the rules. Yes. In the BH, mere days before Ninja did this mm-hmm. BH. So he was accustomed to the sit in motion and the down in motion. Yeah. And then they said, you, you have to stop. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You have to so stop and say it. And he's not accustomed to that. So when when I stopped, he put one f- foot forward because he thought it's going to be a down. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, he, but luckily for me, he remained with that foot in that position until I came back. He didn't move yeah. after that. He yeah. froze. So that shows yeah. the intelligence of them, right? So it's like, whoop. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me just stay here. Oh, you the know, less said about RPH, the better. And um, she was in heat, and it was the uh, it was um, the worst performance of our, uh, that we've made the last year. And it was just one of those things. That t- I, 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 it's um, it's in my nightmares. I'm, I'm never going to think about it again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, um, we've got our IGP one in in two weeks. Uh, I've done okay. I've done the beetles and tracking section of it with her at the last trial. She wasn't ready for protection at the last trial, but I did the beetles and tracking because it was very good for me to have a run through uh, of all the rules and mm-hmm. just do it. So she qualified in, in both, but she'll do the full IGP one this time. You know, I just need a little bit, a little bit more time to get control and her protection because she's got a lot of drive and uh, she right. likes to think that um, if she could run around biting people, life would be perfect. But uh, Unfortunately, that's not really the way IGP works. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I have control now, so um, I feel feel more confident now. But we'll, we'll see. I shouldn't speak too soon. <laughs> nah, no, you, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure she will excel. Real soon. I have, I have a friend who breeds German shepherds and also trains them, and um, I made a T-shirt for him because he always said, "Drive fixes everything." If your dog yeah. has drive, there is nothing you can't teach. Yeah, you know, and it's very true. And my yeah, slogan is "No drive, no joy." I have it on every jersey. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Um, and we, I'm gonna make a, a T-shirt separate with that as well. That, know, that for, would be really good. I'll, <laughs> I'll buy one if you do that. It's really good. Definitely. Yeah. Because it's it's so fitting, right? As a trainer, if I go to a customer and I go to a dog that, yeah, meh, yeah, <laughs> keep your food. I'm not really hungry, and lo- watches the ball roll past, and it's like, yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Then I'm already going. What did I get myself into with this dog? Why did I take on this client? <laughs> you know, yeah. because it, it's the it's the most frustrating training session if a dog is not motivated by anything. There's Especially no drive. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. drive, and it's a big dog, and it's like yeah, like a livestock guardian breed. A lot of those don't have drive for food, and they don't have drive for balls, and they're huge. They're about you know, fourteen stone, and they're just massive, and they have no drive, and they just look at you. <laughs> it's like okay, <laughs> yeah. what do we do? But then you you can always one one. I had um, I found out what he really liked, which was. Of her dogs, and I've got a very, very tolerant female bitch. You'd, you'd, a, li- you'd a little bit, you'd a l- little bit of fear of um, the car, so he didn't want to go in the car. He'd had a bad experience um, uh, with a crash, and uh, we used my my bitch sat her in the car, and and gradually got a bit of confidence to go up in the car and then get in it, and then he was fine. But but she was his incentive because he really liked other dogs, and that that was that was his motivator. So sometimes you have to be a bit creative in finding what motivates him. And he didn't necessarily want to play with her. He just liked hanging out beside her, you know. And she was very, I, she's very stable, likes other dogs. And I came across know. a shepherd who was not food motivated. He was not toy motivated, but he loved protection work. Mm, yeah. So basic obedience was a decoy shadowing us, and every time he did something correct and needed to get rewarded, I sent him on a bite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So biting the sleeve was his reward then. Yeah. You know, even, long, though, long even, even though we, even though we were doing obedience. Yeah, long long <laughs> path to do your obedience that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just did the basics with him, and that was it. I, I said, okay, this, yeah, it, 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 will get too exp- it will get too expensive that way. <laughs> you know, yeah. Because we have to yeah. pay the decoy every session. Yeah, that's very expensive. Yeah. Right. But yeah, it's been an All absolute right. delight to talk to you, and I, I look forward to your T-shirt definitely. You know, that's, uh, yes, I have to have thank to get you. that. No, no, um, yeah. And I will put out um, a review of the book. 
on on my social media by the end of the Hope week. Hope like Yes, we will publish that. And um, yeah, write more like this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. No, I, I'm I'm enjoying reading it. It's it's. I'm glad. I'm glad. Because when I read it, it's, my family is commenting, and I'm reading it, and I'm nodding my head while I'm reading. It's like, yep, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's how I'm going for the book. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Good. And. Yeah, no, it's 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 well written, and I like the the little, the hidden humor in it. Yeah, <laughs> it makes me smile. And um, even though it's a very serious topic, yeah, and and there is nothing disparaging in it. It is just the truth. Yeah, and that's what I like about it. You know, it is not. It is a a good book that debunks a lot of things without getting personal in any way yes because you know i think i think i respect you know i should respect other human beings and everyone has their viewpoint and i think people should be free to live and let live but it's when other people start infringing on my rights and saying especially with something that isn't true and saying well i want to take your enjoyment of life and your lifestyle with your high drag bombs i want to take all that away from you that isn't somebody doesn't have the right to do that to me and I, I just worry that um, the more this happens in more and more countries, there's going to be fewer and fewer places left where we can actually um, live in reality. Uh, you know? I believe that in the long run, this whole force-free thing is going to be just another fad yes, that, will, yeah. that has come, is there, and will go. Yes, yeah. And the rest of us who trained before will train after. Yeah. I, I firmly believe that common sense has to prevail at some time. Reality has to prevail. Yeah. And the more it's being talked about, um, the more it will prevail. Yeah. Because we, we live right. in the real world and unfortunately there is no getting around uh, you know, discomfort and pain and stress and we need some stress to build resilience and yeah. if we didn't have things that went wrong in life, we wouldn't appreciate the things that went right. The best, uh, the best trained people talk about stress. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you if you ask a, a special operator, you know, don't you get afraid every now and again? He says, of course, every time we go out, but that is what keeps us alive. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> they, he said it gets dangerous when we are not afraid. Yes, and, very much. And dangerous so. for us, not for others. It gets dangerous for us if we're not. And afraid. as dog trainers as well, I think. It, it, you know, yeah. when you're doing, you know, we, we always have to be aware of our own limitations and sometimes getting older, I, I, I think, okay, you know, the, the sort of really dangerous dogs aren't for me anymore. I, I, I just like nice, balanced, predictable dogs. I can train well. Mm. Um, you know, I don't mind a hard dog, but, you know, I, you know, I don't like dogs that, you know, are unpredictable, really. I learned but, that the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was, I was living in Greece and, and I was asked to train two Kangals. In, in Istanbul. Oh, that's they, a were, they were puppies. They were seven months old. But at, yeah. that, seven, at that seven months, they're the size of a full-grown Rottweiler. Bro, and, yeah. And they're very aggressive. And they were not from some watered-down, you know, kennel in the U.S. They came from a border region between Turkey and Iraq from some farm. Yeah, yeah. They're the true, <laughs> con- true Kangals, right? And yeah, they're not what I would like to train. <laughs> and I was, I was I was in my <laughs> early 20s and I felt invincible yeah. when it comes to dogs, right? There's you no always dog wear would, when you're that age. <laughs> I would, there's no dog I wouldn't take on. Yeah. And so, you know, I tried the food thing, you know, put the food up in the air to get the dog to sit and he didn't want to sit and then put the other hand on his rear end to kind of gently push on the rock, and I almost lost my hands. That dog went yeah. to town on me. On a, oh, I had dog. to pull up the leash and say, hey. Yeah. <laughs> and I was yeah. taken so by surprise and with the tenacity that this dog we came with it. as a seven-month-old puppy. Yeah. That so it, was a, yeah. it was a wake-up call, right? So, okay, maybe I'm not as invincible as I thought, and there's dogs that will surprise me, you know, and I have a different respect for, for guardian brains ever since. Right. Yes. And, and I've trained. I've trained the 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 Caucasian yeah. mountain dog. You know, and because of my experience with the Kangal, I approach this dog differently. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it worked out well. So, you know, you live and you learn. 
You do, and I think I think that is important that you know there are people who, as I say, I really specialise in a Rottweiler. And I think it's nice when you have a breed that you really love, that you really understand, sort of inside and out, and that you're passionate about. Because you know, I I could you know train a livestock guardian or whatever, but that isn't my passion. That isn't my knowledge. I don't have the knowledge base of somebody that's had this breed for thirty years. How could I ever compete with that? Yes. Um, but you know, with the Rottweiler, it's so, so, it's a breed I absolutely love. Uh, so you know, Rottweiler owners that need some help, you know, I am here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they are fundamentally different dogs, eh? even though people yeah. always compare them. But a Rottweiler is a working dog. Definitely, they're yeah. genetically hardwired to work with us, whereas a, a, a livestock guardian, especially the more exotic ones like the Caucasian Mountain Dog, the yeah. Kangal, yeah. Yeah, the Alibi, they, they're dogs that work independently. They don't need you. Their objective is if you, don't, exactly. if you don't live on this farm or in this house and you approach it, I need to deal with you. Yeah. And they, right? they may only eat every couple of days. They're not really food orientated because they're no. they're, they're genetically, you know, they, they, the way they are, they, they don't necessarily want to eat every day. Well, they might want yeah. to, but in, in their life, the way they've been had bred for however long, you did they cut their own food, and, you know, so yeah. they don't and they want live food. and they live among the animals that they protect. Yeah, yeah, they're they're fantastic, absolutely amazing dogs, fantastic. But I don't have an insight into their mind the way I do a Rottweiler. And, um, and funny enough, I have a friend who did this with with uh, German shepherds. He breeds German shepherds. Yeah, and he also sells eggs, so he has free range chicken. And so yeah. they live outside and they eat the things that they're supposed to be eating, like bugs and worms yeah, and yeah. Uh, all those things. And in order for them not to get stolen, he put um, a couple of, of highly protection trained shepherds in there. And they grew up as puppies. They have, yeah. a, they have a sheltered area, uh, but they grew up among the chicken. Yes, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. So they don't go after the chicken. No, they no, live they don't, among don't. the chicken. They play with the chicken, and and nobody else can come in there. Yeah, yeah. they're like two bad junkyard dogs surrounded yeah. by chicken. Good <laughs> for <laughs> chickens, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's it's amazing to watch. It's amazing yeah. to watch. You know the I intelligence mean, the of the dogs and how they can operate independently. There's, you know, he doesn't have to tell them anything. They just <laughs> know what to do. Yeah, and that's what they're doing. Is, is the dogs are such amazing creatures and we we underestimate them in a lot of ways um, you, you know, know we are lucky to have the love of a creature as wonderful as a dog well said all right so it's been an absolute blast i really enjoyed this yeah, and class, it's been great fun you, you know, must invite me to you must invite me to do a workshop in trinidad <laughs> <laughs> yes and um it's, so, it's been one of the fastest two hours I spent on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, it has. It's been two hours now, but it's been great yes, fun. Yes, yes, yes. It, it doesn't. It didn't feel like it. I'm now looking at the at the recording there. Yes, and um, I'm sure we will do this again. Definitely, yeah. In in the future, and um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for making the time. I really appreciate it. I know you're very busy, and you have so multiple much. job titles. So. <laughs> I can only imagine. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that you, you made the time available to be on on this podcast. Thanks. And um, yeah. No, it's Thank been fantastic. It's been, my pleasure. it's been great fun. I've had a good laugh. We've discussed, we've set the world to rights. And uh, yeah, and here, here's me now come to say hello. I'm, you know. <laughs> I've got a paw now in my paw. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. It's been a real honor to be on your podcast. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. All right, take care. Okay, you too.